Today I've decided to explore an iodine clock reaction that can be done at home with household materials. The general gist of this reaction is that two colorless solutions are mixed, and then after a certain period of time, a sudden color change occurs. There's a lot of different variations and recipes for the iodine clock reactions, but pretty much all of them use some form of iodine and starch. So today we're going to be doing the vitamin C variant and everything that you need is shown here. As I said before, the reaction is a mixture of two colorless solutions and this means we're going to have to be making a solution A and a solution B. Solution A requires two 1000 mg tablets of vitamin C, iodine tincture, and distilled water. My iodine solution was 5% so I used 25 milliliters. But if your solution is, let's say, 2%, you'll have to use 60 milliliters. If you can only find 500 milligram tablets of vitamin C, you can just use four of those instead of two. And also, try not to get the chewable tablets because that has a bunch of extra stuff in it. For solution B, I used 0.4 grams of cornstarch, 150 milliliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide, and distilled water. It's important to note that in both of these solutions I use distilled water and we shouldn't use tap water because this can interfere with some things. We start off by making solution A and for this we need two 1000 mg tablets of vitamin C. Using the back of a spoon I try to crush the tablets. You don't have to completely powderize the tablets but you don't really want to have any chunks left over either. The crushed pills are transferred to a suitable container and here I used a beaker, but in theory you could use anything really. On top of the powderized pills, I then poured in about 60 milliliters of distilled water. This mixture is then stirred for something like 30 seconds. What we're doing here is we're trying to dissolve the vitamin C from the tablets into the water. Most of the pill though is just filler and stuff that's not soluble in water, so don't try to dissolve everything because it's not going to happen. After about 30 seconds of stirring, we're left with a solution that kind of looks like this. Like I said, there's a lot of insoluble stuff in the pills, so to get rid of this, we're going to have to filter it off. The filter system is very simple, and it's just a couple coffee filters in a dollar store funnel. I dump the mixture into the coffee filters, and very quickly, a relatively clear solution starts to come through. This is going to take a little bit of time, so while it's filtering, I'm going to move on to making solution B. To make solution B, we first have to measure out a little bit of cornstarch. In the beginning of the video, I said to use 0.4 grams, but it really doesn't have to be accurate, and you can just estimate based on how much you see here in the video. On top of the cornstarch, I poured in about 350 milliliters of distilled water. Once the water is added, I try to mix up the cornstarch, but the solution remains pretty cloudy. To try to dissolve as much cornstarch as possible, the solution is placed in a microwave and heated up until boiling. Although it's clearer than before, it's still a little too cloudy for my liking, so I filter it through something like four coffee filters. The solution that makes it through is a lot clearer, and it has a lot less free-floating undissolved cornstarch in it. Once it's all filtered through, I remove the funnel and I turn the flask so I can see the volume markings. What we do now is we add about 150 milliliters of 3% hydrogen peroxide. After the peroxide is added and the solution is mixed a little bit, we're done making solution B and we can move back to making solution A. For solution A, the next thing that we need to do is add our iodine tincture to our vitamin C solution. The iodine tincture is very dark and strongly colored, but when it's added to the vitamin C, you can see that the color starts to disappear. After everything's added and the mixture is swirled, it should go back to being colorless. If this doesn't happen, it means you didn't have enough vitamin C. The color of the tincture is due to the presence of iodine or I2, but when it reacts with vitamin C, it's converted to iodide or I-, which is colorless. To finish solution A, we just top things off to about 500 milliliters. Solution A and B are now complete, so we're done with our preparation and we can move on to the fun part. To test things out, we add roughly an equal amount of solution A and B to a beaker and then mix it up. A sudden color change should occur, but this might actually take a little bit of time. So while we're waiting for things to change, I'm going to quickly talk about what's happening here. 
In solution A, we effectively have a mixture of vitamin C and colorless I minus ions, and in solution B, we have hydrogen peroxide and starch. When solutions A and B are mixed, they actually start reacting together, but it's not just one reaction that's occurring, it's two reactions. These two reactions are competing, and they kind of push each other back and forth. The hydrogen peroxide wants to oxidize the I minus back to colored I2, but the ascorbic acid wants to reduce it from I2 back to I minus. This reaction occurs really quickly, and the I2 doesn't exist for very long, and it's extremely transient. Eventually though, the vitamin C is consumed because we've included an excess of hydrogen peroxide, so I2 starts to accumulate. The I2 then very quickly complexes with I- to form a triiodide complex, and this quickly complexes with starch. This all happens extremely quickly, and we're left with a nice blue complex of triiodide and starch. The concentration of each of the reactants and the temperature of the reaction mixture will determine how long it takes for the color change to occur. The color change will occur quicker if we increase the concentration of either the I- or the hydrogen peroxide, and the color change will take longer if we increase the concentration of vitamin C. On top of concentrations, we can alter temperature, so if we increase the temperature, the color change will occur much quicker, and if we decrease the temperature, it will take longer. At the concentration and temperature that I did for this previous demonstration, it took about a minute to change, but for me this was a bit too long, so to speed things up, I heated up my solutions A and B in the microwave. After I heated them up, they were around 50 C, and instead of taking something like a minute, it took something around 10 to 20 seconds. Here we just have an example where solution A is already in a beaker, and I add solution B, but we mix it the whole time. When the solution is being constantly stirred, the color change occurs much more uniformly throughout the whole thing. We can also do the classic demonstration where the solutions are mixed back and forth, and then we slowly pour the solution from one into the other. When we do this, the color should in theory change at the exact same time throughout all of the liquid. Here it kind of looks like it wasn't all at the same time, but it still is pretty close. So here's a demonstration that I kind of thought might be cool, where it looks like we make some instant coke. So just like all of the other demonstrations, we pour solution A or B in, and then we follow it with the other solution. Pouring one solution into the other actually mixes things pretty well, but just to make sure that everything was thoroughly mixed, I shook it around a little. The color change occurs pretty quickly after I place the Coke bottle back down. Some of you might be wondering why I have my phone with a timer running in the background, and this is actually because I don't want people to claim that this is fake or something. I wait a few minutes, and then I place a glass on the side, and I pour out our freshly synthesized Coke. The color is actually surprisingly close to that of actual Coke, you know, except for the purple cloud that comes off when I pour it into the glass. What's interesting is this is from another run, and I didn't wait long enough before pouring the solution, and you can actually see it's green. You have to actually wait a little bit for the peroxide to convert more I- to I2, which has a slight brown color in water. So for now, that's all I really have to say about this method for the iodine clock reaction. I really want to do this method because it's very easily done at home, but I don't think the color change is as fast and instantaneous as some of the other methods. I've also decided to revisit and redo my previous iodine clock reaction video, and I've already filmed that, and that should be up eventually. I haven't posted a video in a while, and it's not because I'm slacking, it's because I've kind of gone on a rampage and filmed a bunch. So as usual, a big thanks goes out to all of my supporters on Patreon, but I have to give a very special thanks to everyone who donated $5 or more. Like I said in a previous video, I kind of have too many $5 supporters to realistically read out each of your names, but just know that I still love you all.